Hello, fellow literature enthusiasts, and welcome back to Obsidian River Productions. Today, we're diving into the heartwarming world of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. In this episode, we'll explore chapters 8 and 9, where we witness the delightful and poignant moments of the March sisters as they navigate their young lives. In chapter 8, titled Joe Meets Apollyon, we find Joe facing a challenging day, struggling with her temper and learning valuable lessons in humility and forgiveness. It's a chapter rich with emotional depth, showing us the complexities of growing up and the power of self-reflection. Following that, Chapter 9, Meg Goes to Vanity Fair, takes us on a journey with Meg as she attends a high society event. Here, we see the contrast of societal expectations and the allure of luxury, juxtaposed with the values of simplicity and integrity that the March family holds dear. As we unravel these chapters, you're not just listening to a story. You're stepping into a world where each character's journey resonates with timeless lessons and heartfelt experiences. And don't forget, if you're enjoying our journey through Little Women, you can download a free audiobook at obsidianriver.com gift. It's our way of saying thank you for joining us on this literary adventure. So get comfortable, hit the subscribe button, and ring that notification bell. Let's immerse ourselves in the charming and insightful world of Little Women. 8. Joe Meets Apollyon Girls, where are you going? asked Amy, coming into their room one Saturday afternoon and finding them getting ready to go out with an air of secrecy which excited her curiosity. Never mind, little girls shouldn't ask questions, returned Joe sharply. Now, if there is anything mortifying to our feelings, when we are young, it is to be told that and to be bidden to run away, dear, is still more trying to us. Amy bridled up at this insult and determined to find out the secret if she teased for an hour. Turning to Meg, who never refused her anything very long, she said coaxingly, Do tell me. I should think you might let me go too, for Beth is fussing over her piano and I haven't got anything to do and am so lonely. I can't, dear, because you aren't invited, began Meg. But Joe broke in impatiently. Now, Meg, be quiet, or you will spoil it all. You can't go, Amy, so don't be a baby and whine about it. You are going somewhere with Lori, I know you are. You were whispering and laughing together on the sofa last night, and you stopped when I came in. Aren't you going with him? Yes, we are. Now do be still and stop bothering. Amy held her tongue, but used her eyes and saw Meg slip a fan into her pocket. I know, I know, you're going to the theater to see the Seven Castles, she cried, adding resolutely, and I shall go, for Mother said I might see it, and I've got my rag money, and it was mean not to tell me in time. Just listen to me a minute, and be a good child, said Meg soothingly. Mother doesn't wish you to go this week, because your eyes are not well enough yet to bear the light of this fairy piece. Next week, you can go with Beth and Hannah, and have a nice time. I don't like that half as well as going with you and Lori. Please let me. I've been sick with this cold so long, and shut up, I'm dying for some fun. Do, Meg. I'll be ever so good, pleaded Amy, looking as pathetic as she could. Suppose we take her. I don't believe Mother would mind if we bundle her up well, began Meg. If she goes, I shan't, and if I don't, Lori won't like it and it will be very rude after he invited only us to go and drag in Amy. I should think she'd hate to poke herself where she isn't wanted, said Joe crossly, for she disliked the trouble of overseeing a fidgety child when she wanted to enjoy herself. Her tone and manner angered Amy, who began to put her boots on, saying, in her most aggravating way, I shall go. Meg says I may, and if I pay for myself, Lori hasn't anything to do with it. You can't sit with us? for our seats are reserved, and you mustn't sit alone, so Lori will give you his place, and that will spoil our pleasure, or he'll get another seat for you, and that isn't proper when you weren't asked. You shan't stir a step, so you may just stay where you are, scolded Joe, crosser than ever, having just pricked her finger in her hurry. Sitting on the floor, with one boot on, Amy began to cry, and Meg to reason with her, when Lori called from below, and the two girls hurried down, leaving their sister wailing, for now and then she forgot her grown-up ways and acted like a spoilt child. Just as the party was setting out, Amy called over the banisters in a threatening tone. You'll be sorry for this, Joe March. See if you ain't. Fiddlesticks! 
returned Joe, slamming the door. They had a charming time, for the seven castles of the Diamond Lake were as brilliant and wonderful as heart could wish. But in spite of the comical red imps, sparkling elves, and gorgeous princes and princesses, Joe's pleasure had a drop of bitterness in it. The fairy queen's yellow curls reminded her of Amy, and between the acts, she amused herself with wondering what her sister would do to make her sorry for it. She and Amy had had many lively skirmishes in the course of their lives, for both had quick tempers and were apt to be violent when fairly roused. Amy teased Joe, and Joe irritated Amy, and semi-occasional explosions occurred, of which both were much ashamed afterward. Although the oldest, Joe had the least self-control and had hard times trying to curb the fiery spirit which was continually getting her into trouble, her anger never lasted long, and, having humbly confessed her fault, she sincerely repented and tried to do better. Her sisters used to say that they rather liked to get Joe into a fury because she was such an angel afterward. Poor Joe tried desperately to be good, but her bosom enemy was always ready to flame up and defeat her, and it took years of patient effort to subdue it. When they got home, they found Amy reading in the parlor. She assumed an injured air as they came in, never lifted her eyes from her book or asked a single question. Perhaps curiosity might have conquered resentment if Beth had not been there to inquire and receive a glowing description of the play. On going up to put away her best hat, Joe's first look was toward the bureau. For, in their last quarrel, Amy had soothed her feelings by turning Joe's top drawer upside down on the floor. Everything was in its place, however, and after a hasty glance into her various closets, bags, and boxes, Joe decided that Amy had forgiven and forgotten her wrongs. There, Joe was mistaken, for next day she made a discovery which produced a tempest. Meg, Beth, and Amy were sitting together late in the afternoon when Joe burst into the room, looking excited and demanding breathlessly, Has anyone taken my book? Meg and Beth said, No, at once, and looked surprised. Amy poked the fire and said nothing. Joe saw her color rise and was down upon her in a minute. Amy, you've got it. No, I haven't. You know where it is, then? No, I don't. That's a fib, cried Joe, taking her by the shoulders and looking fierce enough to frighten a much braver child than Amy. It isn't. I haven't got it. Don't know where it is now, and don't care. You know something about it, and you'd better tell it once, or I'll make you. And Joe gave her a slight shake. Scold as much as you like. You'll never see your silly old book again cried Amy, getting excited in her turn. Why not? I burnt it up. What? My little book I was so fond of and worked over and meant to finish before father got home? Have you really burnt it? said Joe, turning very pale, while her eyes kindled and her hands clutched Amy nervously. Yes, I did. I told you I'd make you pay for being so cross yesterday, and I have, so... Amy got no farther, for Joe's hot temper mastered her, and she shook Amy till her teeth chattered in her head, crying in a passion of grief and anger. You wicked, wicked girl. I never can write it again, and I'll never forgive you as long as I live. Meg flew to rescue Amy and Beth to pacify Joe, but Joe was quite beside herself, and, with a parting box on her sister's ear, she rushed out of the room up to the old sofa in the garret and finished her fight alone. The storm cleared up below, for Mrs. March came home and, having heard the story, soon brought Amy to a sense of the wrong she had done her sister. Joe's book was the pride of her heart and was regarded by her family as a literary sprout of great promise. It was only half a dozen little fairy tales, but Joe had worked over them patiently, putting her whole heart into her work, hoping to make something good enough to print. She had just copied them with great care and had destroyed the old manuscript, so that Amy's bonfire had consumed the loving work of several years. It seemed a small loss to others, but to Joe it was a dreadful calamity, and she felt that it never could be made up to her. Beth mourned as for a departed kitten, and Meg refused to defend her pet. Mrs. March looked grave and grieved, and Amy felt that no one would love her till she had asked pardon for the act which she now regretted more than any of them. When the tea bell rung, Joe appeared, looking so grim and unapproachable that it took all Amy's courage to say meekly, Please forgive me, Joe. I'm very, very sorry. 
I never shall forgive you, was Joe's stern answer, and from that moment she ignored Amy entirely. No one spoke of the great trouble, not even Mrs. March, for all had learned by experience that when Joe was in that mood words were wasted, and the wisest course was to wait till some little accident or her own generous nature softened Joe's resentment and healed the breach. It was not a happy evening, for, though they sewed as usual, while their mother read aloud from Bremer, Scott, or Edgeworth, something was wanting, and the sweet home piece was disturbed. They felt this most when singing time came, for Beth could only play, Joe stood dumb as a stone, and Amy broke down, so Meg and mother sung alone. But, in spite of their efforts to be as cheery as larks, the flute-like voices did not seem to chord as well as usual, and all felt out of tune. As Joe received her goodnight kiss, Mrs. March whispered gently, My dear, don't let the sun go down upon your anger. Forgive each other, help each other, and begin again tomorrow. Joe wanted to lay her head down on that motherly bosom and cry her grief and anger all away. But tears were an unmanly weakness, and she felt so deeply injured that she really couldn't quite forgive yet. So she winked hard, shook her head, and said gruffly, because Amy was listening, It was an abominable thing, and she don't deserve to be forgiven. With that, she marched off to bed, and there was no merry or confidential gossip that night. Amy was much offended that her overtures of peace had been repulsed, and began to wish she had not humbled herself, to feel more injured than ever, and to plume herself on her superior virtue in a way which was particularly exasperating. Joe still looked like a thundercloud, and nothing went well all day. It was bitter cold in the morning. She dropped her precious turnover in the gutter. Aunt March had an attack of fidgets. Meg was pensive. Beth would look grieved and wistful when she got home. And Amy kept making remarks about people who were always talking about being good, and yet wouldn't try when other people set them a virtuous example. Everybody is so hateful. I'll ask Lori to go skating. He is always kind and jolly, and will put me to rights, I know, said Joe to herself, and off she went. Amy heard the clash of skates and looked out with an impatient exclamation. There! She promised I should go next time, for this is the last ice we shall have. But it's no use to ask such a crosspatch to take me. Don't say that. You were very naughty, and it is hard to forgive the loss of her precious little book. But I think she might do it now, and I guess she will if you try her at the right minute, said Meg. Go after them. Don't say anything till Joe has got good-natured with Lori. Then take a quiet minute and just kiss her or do some kind thing, and I'm sure she'll be friends again with all her heart. I'll try, said Amy, for the advice suited her. And, after a flurry to get ready, she ran after the friends, who were just disappearing over the hill. It was not far to the river, but both were ready before Amy reached them. Joe saw her coming and turned her back. Lori did not see, for he was carefully skating along the shore, sounding the ice, for a warm spell had preceded the cold snap. I'll go on to the first bend and see if it's all right before we begin to race, Amy heard him say as he shot away, looking like a young Russian in his fur-trimmed coat and cap. Joe heard Amy panting after her run, stamping her feet and blowing her fingers as she tried to put her skates on, but Joe never turned and went slowly zigzagging down the river, taking a bitter, unhappy sort of satisfaction in her sister's troubles. She had cherished her anger till it grew strong and took possession of her, as evil thoughts and feelings always do, unless cast out at once. As Lori turned the bend, he shouted back, Keep near the shore. It isn't safe in the middle. Joe heard, but Amy was just struggling to her feet and did not catch a word. Joe glanced over her shoulder, and the little demon she was harboring said in her ear, No matter whether she heard or not, let her take care of herself. Lori had vanished round the bend. Joe was just at the turn, and Amy, far behind, striking out toward the smoother ice in the middle of the river. For a minute, Joe stood still, with a strange feeling at her heart. Then she resolved to go on, but something held and turned her round, just in time to see Amy throw up her hands and go down, with the sudden crash of rotten ice, the splash of water, and a cry that made Joe's heart stand still with fear. She tried to call Lori, but her voice was gone. She tried to rush forward, but her feet seemed to have no strength in them, and for a second she could only stand motionless, staring, 
with a terror-stricken face at the little blue hood above the black water. Something rushed swiftly by her, and Lori's voice cried out, Bring a rail! Quick! Quick! How she did it, she never knew. But for the next few minutes, she worked as if possessed, blindly obeying Lori, who was quite self-possessed, and lying flat, held Amy up by his arm in hockey till Joe dragged a rail from the fence, and together they got the child out, more frightened than hurt. Now then, we must walk her home as fast as we can. Pile our things on her while I get off these confounded skates, cried Lori, wrapping his coat round Amy and tugging away at the straps, which never seemed so intricate before. Shivering, dripping, and crying, they got Amy home, and, after an exciting time of it, she fell asleep, rolled in blankets, before a hot fire. During the bustle, Joe had scarcely spoken, but flown about, looking pale and wild, with her things half off, her dress torn, and her hands cut and bruised by ice and rails and refractory buckles. When Amy was comfortably asleep, the house quiet, and Mrs. March sitting by the bed, she called Joe to her and began to bind up the hurt hands. Are you sure she is safe? whispered Joe, looking remorsefully at the golden head, which might have been swept away from her sight forever under the treacherous ice. Quite safe, dear. She is not hurt, and won't even take cold, I think. You are so sensible in covering and getting her home quickly, replied her mother cheerfully. Lori did it all. I only let her go. Mother, if she should die, it would be my fault. And Joe dropped down beside the bed, in a passion of penitent tears, telling all that had happened, bitterly condemning her hardness of heart, and sobbing out her gratitude for being spared the heavy punishment which might have come upon her. It's my dreadful temper. I try to cure it. I think I have, and then it breaks out worse than ever. Oh, mother, what shall I do? What shall I do? cried poor Joe in despair. Watch and pray, dear. Never get tired of trying, and never think it is impossible to conquer your fault, said Mrs. March, drawing the blousy head to her shoulder and kissing the wet cheek so tenderly that Joe cried harder than ever. You don't know. You can't guess how bad it is. It seems as if I could do anything when I'm in a passion. I get so savage. I could hurt anyone and enjoy it. I'm afraid I shall do something dreadful someday and spoil my life and make everybody hate me. Oh, mother, help me. Do help me. I will, my child, I will. Don't cry so bitterly, but remember this day and resolve with all your soul that you will never know another like it. Joe, dear, we all have our temptations, some far greater than yours, and it often takes us all our lives to conquer them. You think your temper is the worst in the world, but mine used to be just like it. Yours, mother? Why, you are never angry. And, for the moment, Joe forgot remorse and surprise. I've been trying to cure it for forty years, and have only succeeded in controlling it. I am angry nearly every day of my life, Joe, but I have learned not to show it, and I still hope to learn not to feel it, though it may take me another forty years to do so. The patience and the humility of the face she loved so well was a better lesson to Joe than the wisest lecture, the sharpest reproof. She felt comforted at once by the sympathy and confidence given her. The knowledge that her mother had a fault like hers, and tried to mend it, made her own easier to bear and strengthened her resolution to cure it, though forty years seemed rather a long time to watch and pray to a girl of fifteen. Mother, are you angry when you fold your lips tight together and go out of the room sometimes, when Aunt March scolds, or people worry you? asked Joe feeling nearer and dearer to her mother than ever before. Yes, I've learned to check the hasty words that rise to my lips, and when I feel that they mean to break out against my will, I just go away a minute and give myself a little shake for being so weak and wicked, answered Mrs. March with a sigh and a smile as she smoothed and fastened up Joe's disheveled hair. How did you learn to keep still? That is what troubles me, for the sharp words fly out before I know what I'm about, and the more I say the worse I get, till it's a pleasure to hurt people's feelings and say dreadful things. Tell me how you do it, Marmy dear. My good mother used to help me. As you do us, interrupted Joe with a grateful kiss. But I lost her when I was a little older than you are, and for years had to struggle on alone, for I was too proud to confess my weakness to anyone else. I had a hard time, Joe, and shed a good many bitter tears over my failures, for, in spite of my efforts, I never seemed to get on. 
Then your father came, and I was so happy that I found it easy to be good. But by and by, when I had four little daughters round me, and we were poor, then the old trouble began again. For I am not patient by nature, and it tried me very much to see my children wanting anything. Poor mother, what helped you then? Your father, Joe. He never loses patience, never doubts or complains, but always hopes and works and waits so cheerfully that one is ashamed to do otherwise before him. He helped and comforted me and showed me that I must try to practice all the virtues I would have my little girls possess, for I was their example. It was easier to try for your sakes than for my own. A startled or surprised look from one of you, when I spoke sharply, rebuked me more than any words could have done, and the love, respect, and confidence of my children was the sweetest reward I could receive for my efforts to be the woman I would have them copy. Oh, mother, if I'm ever half as good as you, I shall be satisfied, cried Joe, much touched. I hope you will be a great deal better, dear, but you must keep watch over your bosom enemy, as father calls it, or it may sadden if not spoil your life. You have had a warning. Remember it, and try with heart and soul to master this quick temper before it brings you greater sorrow and regret than you have known today. I will try, mother, I truly will, but you must help me, remind me, and keep me from flying out. I used to see father sometimes put his finger on his lips and look at you with a very kind but sober face, and you always folded your lips tight or went away. Was he reminding you then? asked Joe softly. Yes, I asked him to help me so, and he never forgot it, but saved me from many a sharp word by that little gesture and kind look. Joe saw that her mother's eyes filled and her lips trembled as she spoke, and fearing that she had said too much, she whispered anxiously, Was it wrong to watch you and to speak of it? I didn't mean to be rude, but it's so comfortable to say all I think to you and feel so safe and happy here. My Joe, you may say anything to your mother, for it is my greatest happiness and pride to feel that my girls confide in me and know how much I love them. I thought I'd grieved you. No, dear, but speaking of father reminded me how much I miss him, how much I owe him, and how faithfully I should watch and work to keep his little daughter safe and good for him. Yet you told him to go, mother, and didn't cry when he went, and never complain now, or seem as if you needed any help, said Joe, wondering. I gave my best to the country I love, and kept my tears till he was gone. Why should I complain, when we both have merely done our duty, and will surely be the happier for it in the end? If I don't seem to need help, it is because I have a better friend, even than father, to comfort and sustain me. My child, the troubles and temptations of your life are beginning, and may be many, but you can overcome and outlive them all if you learn to feel the strength and tenderness of your Heavenly Father as you do that of your earthly one. The more you love and trust Him, the nearer you will feel to Him, and the less you will depend on human power and wisdom. His love and care never tire or change, can never be taken from you, but may become the source of lifelong peace, happiness, and strength. Believe this heartily, and go to God with all your little cares and hopes and sins and sorrows as freely and confidingly as you come to your mother. Joe's only answer was to hold her mother close, and, in the silence which followed, the sincerest prayer she had ever prayed left her heart without words. For in that sad yet happy hour, she had learned not only the bitterness of remorse and despair, but the sweetness of self-denial and self-control. And, led by her mother's hand, she had drawn nearer to the friend who welcomes every child with a love stronger than that of any father, tenderer than that of any mother. Amy stirred and sighed in her sleep, and, as if eager to begin at once to mend her fault, Joe looked up with an expression on her face which it had never worn before. I let the sun go down on my anger. I wouldn't forgive her, and today, if it hadn't been for Lori, it might have been too late. How could I be so wicked? said Joe, half aloud, as she leaned over her sister, softly stroking the wet hair scattered on the pillow. As if she heard, Amy opened her eyes and held out her arms, with a smile that went straight to Joe's heart. Neither said a word, but they hugged one another close, in spite of the blankets, and everything was forgiven and forgotten in one hearty kiss. 9. Meg Goes to Vanity Fair 
I do think it was the most fortunate thing in the world that those children should have the measles just now, said Meg, one April day, as she stood packing the go a broadie trunk in her room, surrounded by her sisters. And so nice of Annie Moffat not to forget her promise. A whole fortnight of fun will be regularly splendid, replied Joe, looking like a windmill as she folded skirts with her long arms. And such lovely weather! I'm so glad of that, added Beth, tidily sorting neck and hair ribbons in her best box, lent for the great occasion. I wish I was going to have a fine time and wear all these nice things, said Amy, with her mouth full of pins, as she artistically replenished her sister's cushion. I wish you were all going, but, as you can't, I shall keep my adventures to tell you when I come back. I'm sure it's the least I can do when you have been so kind, lending me things and helping me get ready, said Meg, glancing round the room at the very simple outfit, which seemed nearly perfect in their eyes. What did Mother give you out of the treasure box? asked Amy, who had not been present at the opening of a certain cedar chest, in which Mrs. March kept a few relics of past splendor as gifts for her girls when the proper time came. A pair of silk stockings, that pretty carved fan, and a lovely blue sash. I wanted the violet silk, but there isn't time to make it over, so I must be contented with my old tarlatan. It will look nicely over my new muslin skirt, and the sash will set it off beautifully. I wish I hadn't smashed my coral bracelet, for you might have had it, said Joe, who loved to give and lend, but whose possessions were usually too dilapidated to be of much use. There is a lovely old-fashioned pearl set in the treasure box, but Mother said real flowers were the prettiest ornament for a young girl, and Lori promised to send me all I want, replied Meg. Now let me see. There's my new gray walking suit. Just curl up the feather in my hat, Beth. Then my poplin, for Sunday, and the small party. It looks heavy for spring, doesn't it? The violet silk would be so nice. Oh, dear. Never mind. You've got the tarlatan for the big party, and you always look like an angel in white, said Amy, brooding over the little store of finery in which her soul delighted. It isn't low-necked, and it doesn't sweep enough, but it will have to do. My blue house dress looks so well, turned and freshly trimmed, that I feel as if I'd got a new one. My silk sack isn't a bit the fashion, and my bonnet doesn't look like Sally's. I didn't like to say anything, but I was sadly disappointed in my umbrella. I told Mother Black, with a white handle, but she forgot, and bought a green one, with a yellowish handle. It's strong and neat, so I ought not to complain, but I know I shall feel ashamed of it beside Annie's silk one with a gold top, sighed Meg, surveying the little umbrella with great disfavor. Change it, advised Joe. I won't be so silly or hurt Marmy's feelings when she took so much pains to get my things. It's a nonsensical notion of mine, and I'm not going to give up to it. My silk stockings and two pairs of new gloves are my comfort. You are a dear to lend me yours, Joe. I feel so rich and sort of elegant with two new pairs and the old ones cleaned up for common and Meg took a refreshing peep at her glove box. Annie Moffat has blue and pink bows on her nightcaps. Would you put some on mine? She asked, as Beth brought up a pile of snowy muslins, fresh from Hannah's hands. No, I wouldn't, for the smart caps won't match the plain gowns without any trimming on them. Poor folks shouldn't rig, said Joe decidedly. I wonder if I shall ever be happy enough to have real lace on my clothes and bows on my caps, said Meg impatiently. You said the other day that you'd be perfectly happy if you could only go to Annie Moffat's, observed Beth in her quiet way. So I did. Well, I am happy and I won't fret. But it does seem as if the more one gets the more one wants, doesn't it? There, now, the trays are ready, and everything in but my ball dress, which I shall leave for mother to pack, said Meg, cheering up as she glanced from the half-filled trunk to the many times pressed and mended white tarlatan, which she called her ball dress, with an important air. The next day was fine, and Meg departed in style for a fortnight of novelty and pleasure. Mrs. March had consented to the visit rather reluctantly, fearing that Margaret would come back more discontented than she went. But she had begged so hard, and Sally had promised to take good care of her, and a little pleasure seemed so delightful after a winter of irksome work that the mother yielded, and the daughter went to take her first taste of fashionable life. The Moffats were very fashionable, and simple Meg was rather daunted at first by the splendor of the house and the elegance of its occupants. But they were kindly people, in spite of the frivolous life they led, 
and soon put their guest at her ease. Perhaps Meg felt, without understanding why, that they were not particularly cultivated or intelligent people, and that all their gilding could not quite conceal the ordinary material of which they were made. It certainly was agreeable to fare sumptuously, drive in a fine carriage, wear her best frock every day, and do nothing but enjoy herself. It suited her exactly, and soon she began to imitate the manners and conversation of those about her, to put on little airs and graces, use French phrases, crimp her hair, take in her dresses, and talk about the fashions as well as she could. The more she saw of Annie Moffat's pretty things, the more she envied her and sighed to be rich. Home now looked bare and dismal as she thought of it. Work grew harder than ever, and she felt that she was a very destitute and much injured girl, in spite of the new gloves and silk stockings. She had not much time for repining, however, for the three young girls were busily employed in having a good time. They shopped, walked, rode, and called all day, went to theaters and operas, or frolicked at home in the evening. For Annie had many friends and knew how to entertain them. Her older sisters were very fine young ladies, and one was engaged, which was extremely interesting and romantic, Meg thought. Mr. Moffat was a fat, jolly old gentleman who knew her father, and Mrs. Moffat, a fat, jolly old lady who took as great a fancy to Meg as her daughter had done. Everyone petted her, and Daisy, as they called her, was in a fair way to have her head turned. When the evening for the small party came, she found that the poplin wouldn't do at all, for the other girls were putting on thin dresses and making themselves very fine indeed. So out came the tarlatan, looking older, limper, and shabbier than ever beside Sally's crisp new one. Meg saw the girls glance at it, and then at one another, and her cheeks began to burn, for, with all her gentleness, she was very proud. No one said a word about it, but Sally offered to dress her hair, and Annie to tie her sash, and Belle, the engaged sister, praised her white arms. But in their kindness, Meg saw only pity for her poverty, and her heart felt very heavy as she stood by herself, while the others laughed, chattered, and flew about like gauzy butterflies. The hard, bitter feeling was getting pretty bad, when the maid brought in a box of flowers. Before she could speak, Annie had the cover off, and all were exclaiming at the lovely roses, heath, and fern within. It's for Belle, of course. George always sends her some, but these are altogether ravishing, cried Annie with a great sniff. They are for Miss March, the man said. And here's a note, put in the maid, holding it to Meg. What fun! Who are they from? Didn't know you had a lover, cried the girls, fluttering about Meg in a high state of curiosity and surprise. The note is from Mother, and the flowers from Lori said Meg simply, yet much gratified that he had not forgotten her. Oh, indeed, said Annie with a funny look, as Meg slipped the note into her pocket as a sort of talisman against envy, vanity, and false pride. For the few loving words had done her good, and the flowers cheered her up by their beauty. Feeling almost happy again, she laid by a few ferns and roses for herself, and quickly made up the rest in dainty bouquets for the breasts, hair, or skirts of her friends, offering them so prettily that Clara, the elder sister, told her she was the sweetest little thing she ever saw, and they looked quite charmed with her small attention. Somehow the kind act finished her despondency, and when all the rest went to show themselves to Mrs. Moffat, she saw a happy, bright-eyed face in the mirror as she laid her ferns against her rippling hair and fastened the roses in the dress that didn't strike her as so very shabby now. She enjoyed herself very much that evening, for she danced to her heart's content. Everyone was very kind, and she had three compliments. Annie made her sing, and someone said she had a remarkably fine voice. Major Lincoln asked who, the fresh little girl with the beautiful eyes, was, and Mr. Moffat insisted on dancing with her because she didn't dawdle, but had some spring in her, as he gracefully expressed it. So, altogether, she had a very nice time, till she overheard a bit of a conversation which disturbed her extremely. She was sitting just inside the conservatory, waiting for her partner to bring her an ice, when she heard a voice ask on the other side of the flowery wall, How old is he? Sixteen or seventeen, I should say, replied another voice. Uh, it would be a grand thing for one of those girls, wouldn't it? Sally says they are very intimate now, and the old man quite dotes on them. Mrs. M has made her plans, I dare say, 
and will play her cards well, early as it is. The girl evidently doesn't think of it yet, said Mrs. Moffat. She told that fib about her mamma as if she did know, and colored up when the flowers came, quite prettily. Poor thing, she'd be so nice if she was only got up in style. Do you think she'd be offended if we offered to lend her a dress for Thursday? asked another voice. She's proud, but I don't believe she'd mind, for that dowdy tarlatan is all she has got. She may tear it tonight, and that will be a good excuse for offering a decent one. We'll see. I shall ask young Lawrence as a compliment to her, and we'll have fun about it afterward. Here Meg's partner appeared, to find her looking much flushed and rather agitated. She was proud, and her pride was useful just then, for it helped her hide her mortification, anger, and disgust at what she had just heard. For, innocent and unsuspicious as she was, she could not help understanding the gossip of her friends. She tried to forget it, but could not, and kept repeating to herself, Mrs. M. has made her plans. That fib about her mama, and dowdy tarlatan, till she was ready to cry and rush home to tell her troubles and ask for advice. As that was impossible, she did her best to seem gay, and being rather excited, she succeeded so well that no one dreamed what an effort she was making. She was very glad when it was all over, and she was quiet in her bed, where she could think and wonder and fume till her head ached and her hot cheeks were cooled by a few natural tears. Those foolish yet well-meant words had opened a new world to Meg, and much disturbed the peace of the old one, in which, till now, she had lived as happily as a child. Her innocent friendship with Laurie was spoilt by the silly speeches she had overheard. Her faith in her mother was a little shaken by the worldly plans attributed to her by Mrs. Moffat, who judged others by herself, and the sensible resolution to be contented with the simple wardrobe which suited a poor man's daughter was weakened by the unnecessary pity of girls who thought a shabby dress one of the greatest calamities under heaven. Poor Meg had a restless night, and got up heavy-eyed, unhappy, half-resentful toward her friends, and half-ashamed of herself for not speaking out frankly and setting everything right. Everybody dawdled that morning, and it was noon before the girls found energy enough even to take up their worsted work. Something in the manner of her friends struck Meg at once. They treated her with more respect, she thought, took quite a tender interest in what she said, and looked at her with eyes that plainly betrayed curiosity. All this surprised and flattered her, though she did not understand it till Miss Bell looked up from her writing, and said, with a sentimental air, Daisy, dear, I've sent an invitation to your friend, Mr. Lawrence, for Thursday. We should like to know him, and it's only a proper compliment to you. Meg colored, but a mischievous fancy to tease the girls made her reply demurely, you are very kind, but I'm afraid he won't come. Why not, Cherie? asked Miss Bell. He's too old. My child, what do you mean? What is his age, I beg to know? cried Miss Clara. Nearly seventy, I believe, answered Meg, counting stitches, to hide the merriment in her eyes. You sly creature! Of course we meant the young man, exclaimed Miss Bell, laughing. There isn't any. Laurie is only a little boy and Meg laughed also at the queer look which the sisters exchanged as she thus described her supposed lover. "'About your age,' Nan said. "'Nearer my sister Joe's. I am seventeen in August,' returned Meg, tossing her head. "'It's very nice of him to send you flowers, isn't it?' said Annie, looking wise about nothing. "'Yes, he often does to all of us, for their house is full, and we are so fond of them. My mother and old Mr. Lawrence are friends, you know,' so it is quite natural that we children should play together. And Meg hoped they would say no more. It's evident Daisy isn't out yet, said Miss Clara to Bell with a nod. Quite a pastoral state of innocence all round, returned Miss Bell with a shrug. I'm going out to get some little matters for my girls. Can I do anything for you, young ladies? asked Mrs. Moffat, lumbering in like an elephant in silk and lace. No, thank you, ma'am, replied Sally. I've got my new pink silk for Thursday, and don't want a thing. Nor I, began Meg, but stopped, because it occurred to her that she did want several things, and could not have them. What shall you wear? asked Sally. My old white one again, if I can mend it fit to be seen. It got sadly torn last night, said Meg, trying to speak quite easily, but feeling very uncomfortable. Why don't you send home for another? said Sally, who was not an observing young lady. 
I haven't got any other. It cost Meg an effort to say that, but Sally did not see it, and exclaimed in amiable surprise, Only that? How funny! She did not finish her speech, for Belle shook her head at her and broke in, saying kindly, Not at all. Where is the use of having a lot of dresses when she isn't out? There's no need of sending home, Daisy, even if you had a dozen, for I've got a sweet blue silk laid away, which I've outgrown, and you shall wear it to please me, won't you, dear? You are very kind, but I don't mind my old dress if you don't. It does well enough for a little girl like me, said Meg. Now do let me please myself by dressing you up in style. I admire to do it, and you'd be a regular little beauty, with a touch here and there. I shan't let anyone see you till you are done, and then we'll burst upon them like Cinderella and her godmother, going to the ball, said Belle in her persuasive tone. Meg couldn't refuse the offer so kindly made, for a desire to see if she would be a little beauty after touching up caused her to accept and forget all her former uncomfortable feelings towards the Moffats. On the Thursday evening, Belle shut herself up with her maid, and between them, they turned Meg into a fine lady. They crimped and curled her hair, they polished her neck and arms with some fragrant powder, touched her lips with coralline salve to make them redder, and Hortense would have added a soupçon of rouge if Meg had not rebelled. They laced her into a sky-blue dress, which was so tight she could hardly breathe, and so low in the neck that modest Meg blushed at herself in the mirror. A set of silver filigree was added, bracelets, necklace, brooch, and even earrings, for Hortense tied them on with a bit of pink silk, which did not show. A cluster of tea rosebuds at the bosom and a ruche reconciled Meg to the display of her pretty white shoulders, and a pair of high-heeled blue silk boots satisfied the last wish of her heart. A laced handkerchief, a plumy fan, and a bouquet in a silver holder finished her off, and Miss Bell surveyed her with the satisfaction of a little girl with a newly dressed doll. Mademoiselle is charmante, très jolie, is she not? cried Hortense, clasping her hands in an affected rapture. Come and show yourself, said Miss Bell, leading the way to the room where the others were waiting. As Meg went rustling after, with her long skirts trailing, her earrings tinkling, her curls waving, and her heart beating, she felt as if her fun had really begun at last, for the mirror had plainly told her that she was a little beauty. Her friends repeated the pleasing phrase enthusiastically, and for several minutes she stood, like the jackdaw in the fable, enjoying her borrowed plumes, while the rest chattered like a party of magpies. While I dress, do you drill her, Nan, in the management of her skirt and those French heels, or she will trip herself up. Take your silver butterfly and catch up that long curl on the left side of her head, Clara, and don't any of you disturb the charming work of my hands, said Belle as she hurried away, looking well pleased with her success. I'm afraid to go down. I feel so queer and stiff and half-dressed, said Meg to Sally as the bell rang, and Mrs. Moffat sent to ask the young ladies to appear at once. You don't look a bit like yourself, but you are very nice. I'm nowhere beside you, for Belle has heaps of taste, and you're quite French, I assure you. Let your flowers hang. Don't be so careful of them, and be sure you don't trip, returned Sally, trying not to care that Meg was prettier than herself. Keeping that warning carefully in mind, Margaret got safely downstairs and sailed into the drawing rooms, where the Moffats and a few early guests were assembled. She very soon discovered that there is a charm about fine clothes which attracts a certain class of people and secures their respect. Several young ladies, who had taken no notice of her before, were very affectionate all of a sudden. Several young gentlemen, who had only stared at her at the other party, now not only stared, but asked to be introduced and said all manner of foolish but agreeable things to her. And several old ladies, who sat on sofas and criticized the rest of the party, inquired who she was with an air of interest. She heard Mrs. Moffat reply to one of them, Daisy March, father a colonel in the army, one of our first families, but reverses of fortune, you know, intimate friends of the Lawrences, sweet creature, I assure you, my Ned is quite wild about her. Dear me, said the old lady, putting up her glass for another observation of Meg, who tried to look as if she had not heard, and been rather shocked at Mrs. Moffat's fibs. The queer feeling did not pass away, but she imagined herself acting the new part of fine lady, and so got on pretty well, 
Though the tight dress gave her a side ache, the train kept getting under her feet, and she was in constant fear lest her earrings should fly off and get lost or broken. She was flirting her fan and laughing at the feeble jokes of a young gentleman who tried to be witty, when she suddenly stopped laughing and looked confused, for, just opposite, she saw Laurie. He was staring at her with undisguised surprise, and disapproval also, she thought, for, though he bowed and smiled, yet something in his honest eyes made her blush and wish she had her old dress on. To complete her confusion, she saw Belle nudge Annie, and both glance from her to Laurie, who, she was happy to see, looked unusually boyish and shy. Silly creatures, to put such thoughts into my head. I won't care for it, or let it change me a bit, thought Meg, and rustled across the room to shake hands with her friend. I'm glad you came, I was afraid you wouldn't, she said, with her most grown-up air. Joe wanted me to come, and tell her how you looked, so I did, answered Lori, without turning his eyes upon her, though he half smiled at her maternal tone. What shall you tell her? asked Meg, full of curiosity to know his opinion of her, yet feeling ill at ease with him for the first time. I shall say I didn't know you, for you look so grown up and unlike yourself, I'm quite afraid of you, he said, fumbling at his glove button. How absurd of you! The girls dressed me up for fun and I rather like it. Wouldn't Joe stare if she saw me? said Meg, bent on making him say whether he thought her improved or not. Yes, I think she would returned Lori gravely. Don't you like me so? asked Meg. No, I don't, was the blunt reply. Why not? In an anxious tone. He glanced at her frizzled head, bare shoulders, and fantastically trimmed dress with an expression that abashed her more than his answer, which had not a particle of his usual politeness about it. I don't like fuss and feathers. That was altogether too much from a lad younger than herself, and Meg walked away, saying petulantly, You are the rudest boy I ever saw. Feeling very much ruffled, she went and stood at a quiet window to cool her cheeks, for the tight dress gave her an uncomfortably brilliant color. As she stood there, Major Lincoln passed by, and, a minute after, she heard him saying to his mother, They are making a fool of that little girl. I wanted you to see her, but they have spoiled her entirely. She's nothing but a doll tonight. Oh, dear, sighed Meg. I wish I'd been sensible and worn my own things. Then I should not have disgusted other people or felt so uncomfortable and ashamed myself. She leaned her forehead on the cool pane and stood half hidden by the curtains, never minding that her favorite waltz had begun, till someone touched her. And turning, she saw Lori looking penitent, as he said, with his very best bow and his hand out, Please forgive my rudeness and come and dance with me. I'm afraid it will be too disagreeable to you, said Meg, trying to look offended and failing entirely. Not a bit of it. I'm dying to do it. Come, I'll be good. I don't like your gown, but I do think you are. Just splendid. And he waved his hands as if words failed to express his admiration. Meg smiled and relented and whispered as they stood waiting to catch the time. Take care my skirt don't trip you up. It's the plague of my life, and I was a goose to wear it. Pin it round your neck, and then it will be useful, said Lori, looking down at the little blue boots, which he evidently approved of. Away they went, fleetly and gracefully, for, having practiced at home, they were well matched, and the blithe young couple were a pleasant sight to see, as they twirled merrily round and round, feeling more friendly than ever after their small tiff. Lori, I want you to do me a favor, will you? said Meg, as he stood fanning her when her breath gave out, which it did very soon, though she would not own why. Won't I? said Lori with alacrity. Please don't tell them at home about my dress tonight. They won't understand the joke, and it will worry Mother. Then why did you do it? said Lori's eyes, so plainly that Meg hastily added. I shall tell them myself all about it, and fess to Mother how silly I've been, but I'd rather do it myself, so you'll not tell, will you? I give you my word I won't. Only what shall I say when they ask me? Just say I looked pretty well and was having a good time. I'll say the first, with all my heart. But how about the other? You don't look as if you were having a good time, are you? And Lori looked at her with an expression which made her answer in a whisper, No, not just now. Don't think I'm horrid. I only wanted a little fun, 
but this sort doesn't pay, I find, and I'm getting tired of it. Here comes Ned Moffat. What does he want? said Laurie, knitting his black brows, as if he did not regard his young host in the light of a pleasant addition to the party. He put his name down for three dances, and I suppose he's coming for them. What a bore, said Meg, assuming a languid air, which amused Laurie immensely. He did not speak to her again till supper time, when he saw her drinking champagne with Ned and his friend Fisher, who were behaving like a pair of fools, as Laurie said to himself, for he felt a brotherly sort of right to watch over the marches and fight their battles whenever a defender was needed. You'll have a splitting headache tomorrow if you drink much of that. I wouldn't, Meg. Your mother doesn't like it, you know, he whispered, leaning over her chair as Ned turned to refill her glass, and Fisher stooped to pick up her fan. I'm not Meg tonight. I'm a doll who does all sorts of crazy things. Tomorrow I shall put away my fuss and feathers and be desperately good again, she answered with an affected little laugh. Wish tomorrow was here then, muttered Laurie, walking off, ill-pleased at the change he saw in her. Meg danced and flirted, chattered and giggled as the other girls did. After supper, she undertook the German and blundered through it, nearly upsetting her partner with her long skirt and romping in a way that scandalized Lori, who looked on and meditated a lecture. But he got no chance to deliver it, for Meg kept away from him till he came to say goodnight. Remember, she said, trying to smile, for the splitting headache had already begun. Silence a la mort, replied Lori, with a melodramatic flourish as he went away. This little bit of byplay excited Annie's curiosity, but Meg was too tired for gossip and went to bed feeling as if she had been to a masquerade and hadn't enjoyed herself as much as she expected. She was sick all the next day, and on Saturday went home, quite used up with her fortnight's fun, and feeling that she had sat in the lap of luxury long enough. It does seem pleasant to be quiet and not have company manners on all the time. Home is a nice place, though it isn't splendid, said Meg, looking about her with a restful expression as she sat with her mother and Joe on the Sunday evening. I'm glad to hear you say so, dear, for I was afraid home would seem dull and poor to you after your fine quarters, replied her mother, who had given her many anxious looks that day, for motherly eyes are quick to see any change in children's faces. Meg had told her adventures gaily and said over and over what a charming time she had had, but something still seemed to weigh upon her spirits, and when the younger girls were gone to bed, she sat thoughtfully staring at the fire, saying little and looking worried. As the clock struck nine and Joe proposed bed, Meg suddenly left her chair and, taking Beth's stool, leaned her elbows on her mother's knee, saying bravely, Marmy, I want a fess. I thought so. What is it, dear? Shall I go away? asked Joe discreetly. Of course not. Don't I always tell you everything? I was ashamed to speak of it before the children, but I want you to know all the dreadful things I did at the Moffats. We are prepared said Mrs. March, smiling, but looking a little anxious. I told you they dressed me up, but I didn't tell you that they powdered and squeezed and frizzled and made me look like a fashion plate. Lori thought I wasn't proper. I know he did, though he didn't say so, and one man called me a doll. I knew it was silly, but they flattered me and said I was a beauty and quantities of nonsense, so I let them make a fool of me. Is that all? asked Joe as Mrs. March looked silently at the downcast face of her pretty daughter and could not find it in her heart to blame her little follies. No, I drank champagne and romped and tried to flirt and was altogether abominable, said Meg self-reproachfully. There is something more, I think. And Mrs. March smoothed the soft cheek, which suddenly grew rosy, as Meg answered slowly. Yes, it's very silly, but I want to tell it because I hate to have people say and think such things about us and Lori. Then she told the various bits of gossip she had heard at the Moffats, and as she spoke, Joe saw her mother fold her lips tightly, as if ill-pleased that such ideas should be put into Meg's innocent mind. Well, if that isn't the greatest rubbish I ever heard, cried Joe indignantly, why didn't you pop out and tell them so on the spot? I couldn't. It was so embarrassing for me. I couldn't help hearing at first, and then I was so angry and ashamed, I didn't remember that I ought to go away. Just wait till I see Annie Moffat, and I'll show you how to settle such ridiculous stuff, 
The idea of having plans and being kind to Lori because he's rich and may marry us by and by. Won't he shout when I tell him what those silly things say about us poor children? And Joe laughed, as if, on second thoughts, the thing struck her as a good joke. If you tell Lori, I'll never forgive you. She mustn't, must she, mother? said Meg, looking distressed. No, never repeat that foolish gossip, and forget it as soon as you can, said Mrs. March gravely. I was very unwise to let you go among people of whom I know so little, kind, I dare say, but worldly, ill-bred, and full of these vulgar ideas about young people. I'm more sorry than I can express for the mischief this visit may have done you, Meg. Don't be sorry. I won't let it hurt me. I'll forget all the bad, and remember only the good, for I did enjoy a great deal, and thank you very much for letting me go. I'll not be sentimental or dissatisfied, Mother. I know I'm a silly little girl, and I'll stay with you till I'm fit to take care of myself. But it is nice to be praised and admired, and I can't help saying I like it, said Meg, looking half ashamed of the confession. That is perfectly natural and quite harmless if the liking does not become a passion and lead one to do foolish or unmaidenly things. Learn to know and value the praise which is worth having and to excite the admiration of excellent people by being modest as well as pretty, Meg. Margaret sat thinking a moment, while Joe stood with her hands behind her, looking both interested and a little perplexed. For it was a new thing to see Meg blushing and talking about admiration, lovers, and things of that sort. And Joe felt as if, during that fortnight, her sister had grown up amazingly and was drifting away from her into a world where she could not follow. Mother, do you have plans, as Mrs. Moffat said? asked Meg bashfully. Yes, my dear, I have a great many. All mothers do, but mine differ somewhat from Mrs. Moffat's, I suspect. I will tell you some of them, for the time has come when a word may set this romantic little head and heart of yours right, on a very serious subject. You are young, Meg, but not too young to understand me, and mother's lips are the fittest to speak of such things to girls like you. Joe, your turn will come in time, perhaps, so listen to my plans and help me carry them out if they are good. Joe went and sat on one arm of the chair, looking as if she thought they were about to join in some very solemn affair. Holding a hand of each, and watching the two young faces wistfully, Mrs. March said, in her serious yet cheery way, I want my daughters to be beautiful, accomplished, and good, to be admired, loved, and respected, to have a happy youth, to be well and wisely married, and to lead useful, pleasant lives, with as little care and sorrow to try them as God sees fit to send. To be loved and chosen by a good man is the best and sweetest thing which can happen to a woman, and I sincerely hope my girls may know this beautiful experience. It is natural to think of it, Meg, right to hope and wait for it, and wise to prepare for it, so that, when the happy time comes, you may feel ready for the duties and worthy of the joy. My dear girls, I am ambitious for you, but not to have you make a dash in the world. Marry rich men merely because they are rich or have splendid houses, which are not homes because love is wanting. Money is a needful and precious thing, and, when well used, a noble thing. But I never want you to think it is the first or only prize to strive for. I'd rather see you poor men's wives if you were happy, beloved, contented, than queens on thrones, without self-respect and peace. Poor girls don't stand any chance, Bell says, unless they put themselves forward, sighed Meg. Then we'll be old maids, said Joe stoutly. Right, Joe. Better be happy old maids than unhappy wives or unmaidenly girls running about to find husbands, said Mrs. March decidedly. Don't be troubled, Meg. Poverty seldom daunts a sincere lover. Some of the best and most honored women I know were poor girls, but so loveworthy that they were not allowed to be old maids. Leave these things to time. Make this home happy, so that you may be fit for homes of your own if they are offered you, and contented here if they are not. One thing remember, my girls. Mother is always ready to be your confidant, father to be your friend, and both of us trust and hope that our daughters, whether married or single, will be the pride and comfort of our lives. We will, Marmy, we will, cried both with all their hearts as she bade them good night. And that brings us to the end of today's journey through the heartwarming episodes of Little Women. As we follow Jo's struggle with her temper and Meg's encounter with the allurements of high society, 
I hope you found inspiration and reflection in the timeless lessons of the March sisters. Thank you for joining me here at Obsidian River Productions. It's been a pleasure sharing these classic stories with you. Remember, literature is not just about reading or listening. It's about experiencing, learning, and growing. If you've enjoyed our time together, please consider subscribing to our channel and turning on notifications so you never miss an episode. Your support means the world to us and helps us keep the spirit of classic literature alive. Before you go, don't forget to visit obsidianriver.com gift to download your free audiobook. It's a small gift from us to you to keep the joy of reading thriving in your life. Stay tuned for more timeless tales, and until next time, keep the pages turning and your imagination flowing.